And then State of the Union, I've got a game we're going to play when we do the Washington Nationals, which should be, which should be fun. I'm trying to make the State of the Unions a bit more interactive uh, to make them more entertaining for you guys too. Because I know you can easily zone out and be like, all right, end of the fucking episode. Just got to stay on screen for four more minutes. <laughs> I was prepared to zone out if you guys were going to go heavy on the messy stuff. I'm just going to take a nap. We're not even, I, as far as I know, we're not touching it. I see it's not on the list. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, staying true. All right, ready? Yeah. Cool. Um. <laughs> In DC, we're just hoping that you listen. Welcome to District Divided, everybody. I am Amit, one of the hosts joining me. The other co-hosts, Matt, Elsie, Spencer, and KDOT, and we have got an awesome episode for you guys today. Again, we're focused on DC sports, but we do dabble in the national topics, and KDOT had a terrible take. Team USA won the gold medal. Team USA men's basketball won the gold medal, and Kadeen, for him, it wasn't enough. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to get into why he feels that way. It's absolutely insane. Then we talk about Diame Brown, who is the hottest thing on the planet right now apparently rookie wide receiver for the washington football team should we buy into the hype should we invest in diami brown stock then we get into the state of the washington nationals we basically traded everybody away matt is going to lead us through that segment we're going to talk about his thoughts on that and then the most impressive gold medal one at the Olympics. We're looking for an individual, but if you happen to go with the team, that is totally fine. We'd love your comments below on this video, so please chime in and we can react to that as well. But we got to begin with Spencer Dinwiddie, actually, who is officially on the dollar bet train. If you didn't see, he made a dollar bet with the Washington Wizards. If we win the championship in the next three years, he gets one dollar and i'm so proud of you spencer dinwiddie you clearly watch this podcast he's he's officially part of the dollar bet fraternity if you will i love guys. that Absolutely. i love that imagine what he's gonna do with that dollar like you would frame it and you like i don't even know the frame should be a whole wall what would you do with that dollar he wants it in pennies he said he <laughs> wants a hundred pennies instead of just a crisp single dollar bill i absolutely <laughs> love it spencer dinwiddie I wasn't on the fence. I was excited, but now he's the guy. He is, it's his franchise at this point, not Brad's anymore. He's officially on the dollar bet train. But uh, let's go ahead and get into KDOT's terrible, terrible Team USA uh, prediction. Uh, we had a dollar bet that Team USA would win gold. Matt and I were correct. And of course, KDOT was incorrect, uh, has to be stated. KDOT, give us your insane take. Team USA won gold. What, what the hell are you want to talk about? Well, just like Spencer Dimwitty, I'm going to be a loser in dollar bets, apparently, because of goddamn Team USA. Um, look, I don't think, like I said in this pod, that you deserve credit for doing the things you're supposed to do. And Team USA did with it. No, I'm joking. Honestly, I've been trolling the entire time. I was wrong. I was wrong. I was totally wrong. I apologize. I'm sorry. KD, Matt, can't really apologize to you just yet. I dislike you too much. I'm it. I'm sorry. It's just one of these things where it's like, like, look, I had zero faith in Team USA getting gold. Okay. I had zero faith. But if we're going to keep it real, like real, real, when we were in the tag, when, when the game was on and I'm it's talking trash about, hey, this is a slam dunk and gold can he say bye bye to your dollar. I know you were sweating bullets by the end of that damn game because it wasn't like it was some sort of blowout. I think the entire grand scheme of this when it comes to Team USA that was going into this year for me is that if I'm looking at you had a bubble season and now a, a, a shortened season where you had a bunch of injuries, long season or a short season, but it felt like forever, I didn't think that things were lining up for Team USA. Then the biggest part about it, which is something I complain about all the time, is I hate the way American basketball is played compared to the international game. And if you look across the league right now, Look at the draft. How many of these names can you not pronounce? There are so many international players in the league right now. I think that the, the days that we have seen Team USA, ever what, looking back from the dream team all the way to 04, when we did lose, if anybody wants that history lesson, the world has caught up. The world is catching up. I mean, they're not caught up. Those are two different yet. statements. I got okay, fair, go ahead. fair. They are catching up. And I don't think 
if you look at the final score of that goal game, it doesn't seem like I completely lost my goddamn mind in thinking that they could have lost that game. If anybody tells me it wasn't close, you're full of shit. You were sweating. When that game was getting out of the final. You didn't lose your goddamn mind, but you lost your goddamn dollar because you we are the I, I, best I, I, basketball <laughs> nation that exists. We can it, we just proved we can send just about anybody. We sent some stars. Dude, we sent JaVale McGee. But we sent JaVale the, McGee. We spent the we NBA. JaVale McGee. And, NBA, and by the way, apology accepted. The, um, the NBA uh, is worth tens of billions of dollars, okay? And I think even they have, do they get to 100 billion? Because I know each franchise is worth what, like two, three plus you don't I'll be that. honest, I but, have no idea, but I can say with absolute certainty it has. Yeah, so they, they're, they're worth a fuck ton. And outside of that, if you look at just the way America runs, ever since you're little, like city, rural, it doesn't matter. We're raised around the sport. Like we are far and wide leading as far as culture and basketball in our country. And it used to be when our best players went over there to go play. It, it wasn't a contest. We would sweep through all of them. 04, I think, was the warning shot. And to me, when you saw how terrible Team USA struggled, especially early, I just thought, all right, it, it's time. Like, it's, it's going to be that time. And you even see the NBA itself. They're, they're instituting new rule changes as far as the way that the fouling goes, which is something that you can see Team USA was not used to when they first got in it, thinking that they could draw every kind of foul with every kind of which contact. And it's not the way the game is played internationally. I'm just saying... Right now, we can't rest on our laurels. International basketball is catching up. Luka Doncic is about to be the face of the NBA. I, I didn't think that would happen. Nikola Jokic is the fucking MVP. Gian- Giannis. Giannis Antetokounmpo the, is the – like, sh- come on, Sure, dog. sure, sure. But first of all, those guys are not all from the same country. So that, that's one that's player right. on each of those teams. And there are still many young stars that did not play for the U.S., right? There was no Trey Young. Well, there's also old stars that didn't there's play. There's no Zion. Exactly. Of course, there's no, there's no Braun. I mean, there's, Is there's that no, get Steph, no Steph Curry, no Kawhi Leonard. No Cade Cunningham. Are more, um, on, as the years go on, less of the stars are going. Right. But, but do you think that is a little bit because of how boring it has gotten? I bet if there was a challenge, they would definitely go. Yes. yes. Like, okay, but, does, but there who does Giannis that, represent nationally, internationally? Same group. Greece. 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 Okay, well, he's got two brothers, too. So they could end up posing a threat at some point. I'm sure they all make the team. I'm sure it's not just Giannis, and then they're like, oh, sorry, Thanasis, sorry to, you know, the other brother. Like, yeah, of course they not. are going to be threats. Well, you are right. They're absolutely, thank you. They're absolutely going to be threats to the United States C team moving forward, and maybe the B team as well. But when it comes down to it, if we were to send our best, and we didn't, we, we never do anymore. Everybody. Why don't we? But that's the because thing. Is that the, but, they're still catching up. It, they're catching up to C and B levels. There's still a ways to go until they get to that A level. I, I don't think the Olympics rest as high as you guys do with a lot of the NBA stars. I honestly don't. It, sure. But 2008 was the call, right? That right. was the return right. of American gold. And it was everyone wanted to be a part of that team. Right. Because the law, the law scared the shit out of everybody. Right. So like right. The, the, that's the thing is that like and it's the same thing that would have happened this year potentially if they lost and everybody would have gone right back like this is unacceptable because of the natural the national discussion behind it. Right. They would it would have put the impetus on players to say all right we got to do this which means you either got to be shamed into thinking that you, like oh oh shit we're we're not about something and then go do it or you got to have the financial incentive which my problem exist. my problem is that you thought a like 50 year old louis scola was suddenly going to beat the united states that was my issue 40. all of a sudden hernan gomez is suddenly a, a threat to the united states well, that was my issue with your dollar human, bet man. evan 48 fine rudy gobert fine i'm sure there was a guy named francois on the bench like those were the guys you were anticipating were going to take down the united states and that was just a ridiculous take and then doubling down and being like, no, we were supposed to do this the whole time. I think, I think there's one more factor here, which is like, Kadeem was talking about how, like, how much the, the league is worth, right? Like the NBA and like how much talent there is in the United States in terms of basketball. What happens too is that you can have only five on the court, right? Like if you could put four different US teams against four different Australia game, uh, teams, you would have the first game would be close and the other three would be absolute blowouts, right? But you can only put five on the court. And I think like, at some point, you have these teams that can gather five, six great players like France, like Australia did um, back in the day, like Argentina did. And then you can have a competitive team, whereas like the U.S. has 
20 players that would be amazing on the court, but you can put five, right? So like there's a limit to how much talent you can put in at the same time. And it's just a matter of like the U S is super deep, but it doesn't help all the time, right? Like at some point you just have to cut it and you have just five on the court. It, it, it helps a lot. I mean, it helps that, that KD is only playing, especially after playing an NBA when, season It helps that you only need KD to play 22 minutes or Dane right. to play 24 minutes or whatever. So, I mean, I still think that is super helpful to have it. And I, I mean, it's true that that the NBA dream team era and, and even, you know, the Kobe's and runs have inspired new countries, but it's clear, even after we put out this team today, where we probably didn't even know some of the guys on the team, like that well at all, or could you even name what team they're all on? Maybe, um, you know, with that, they still won gold. So I don't know. I, I don't really see this year as a sign that other countries are truly catching up. If we send this team out there with, this many players staying home, even with like a young core that is still good. I mean, if you still look at it, I agree. Now, if you, if you see the top 20 draft picks, probably four, three or four of them are international, but that doesn't mean anywhere. The gap is, is really, really that close. Hey, Dad, and also, you, go, go ahead, Spence. Go ahead. I was just going to add a thing. Sorry, Elsie, just to, um, it is five on the court, but bench, bench death, bench depth is huge in the Olympics. So like, yeah, five on the court, but we're not asking these guys to shoulder 36 minute loads. You don't even, sure. it doesn't really matter. So, I mean, if you have 12 guys that are all stars, yeah, another team might be able to put five starters, but they're not going to, are they going to play them, you know, 40 minutes but, a game? No. Of course not. But that's what I mean. Like the U S is so deep that like the U S could put four different teams that could competitively play for silver or gold on the, on the Olympics, right? Like if you put, if you disperse them correctly, you could probably do that. And so it's a little bit, it, it, it's like depth, but at some point it's not, you know, you're just going to win because of how, how deep you are. Like if another team starts to be deep, I think that the one thing with the world catching up though, is that what happens with a lot of other teams is that it happens in waves. So like the U S has been consistently amazing at basketball for decades and will continue to be so. Whereas like Argentina had a golden generation. I'm sure this Australian team is like a golden generation and that doesn't mean that they're going to persist or, or, or the next generation would be better. You know, there's sort of waves of teams that come up. There's, you know, five, six, seven great players that coincide sort of chronologically and then things sort of wean off. Whereas the U S is just like, constantly a mill of amazing players i will yeah. say though and one australia, thing australia is playing with other best player too Keep no mind. ben simmons watch, watch out for the next year it, Kyrie's from Kyrie's from australia too <laughs> oh does he represent fair. them but he represents the US. just saying i mean knowing Kyrie, he probably said i'm a world citizen i'm just gonna go and do such and such I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I see seems like a Kyrie nah. thing play <laughs> under the olympic nah. flag i'm just saying <laughs> look uh, oh, look at the end of the day i just don't look the, the idea that I'm getting laughed out of here on my take is bullshit. We beat France by five fucking points. We have been beat before. It's not an impossibility. So we lost once. That shit. We lost once in the That's last. That's not true. Hold on. In the last we what? Lost one, we lost once in the last. In the last. I don't know, 30 years. One, one medal. Gotcha. Now, also, if we're looking at this team, they lost at the beginning of this two games. Were there the first two games they lost in how many games? games? How many games? games. Matt, how many games? They lost one real game. Matt, how many games? Thank you. I'm just saying, you guys talk about about how it's an impossibility. Yeah, we talk about practice. We talk about practice. Allen Iverson was on that 0-14 the fucking loss. I'm just saying, it's not an impossibility. You guys laughing me out the building is bullshit. I know your sweat was dripping from everyone... (laughs) Get the fuck out of here. You know what I'm saying, and I'm not going to stand for it. It's bullshit. I know you guys was, God damn, if this mother, if this fat motherfucker was right about this, we got to go hear his loud ass mouth in the podcast. I know y'all was sweating, boys. I don't want to hear your shit. I will, I, say, I will say the reason I was sweating a little bit was because it looked like they were playing as the 2004 Detroit Pistons instead of the 2020 <laughs> Wizards. These guys could not hit a fucking shot forever for like stretches they would go over 12 from three and i was like what the hell is going on is this not kevin durant is this not devin booker is this not zach levy like they all forgot how to shoot but they just needed time together once they got the time together like they didn't have in those exhibition games then they figured it out then they figured out kd's the top dog as unbelievable as it is you could tell some of the other guys were like actually i could be the kd of this team and it was not true it clearly was not true kd took over thank the lord a very satisfying dollar, but seriously, I, they could shoot better than that. I will. I will say, KD 
gets my respect and I'm sorry for doubting you. You are, the, the amount of times you've gone, the amount of points you've scored, the fact that you've been a leader when I didn't think you had any leadership qualities, I still kind of don't. You did it. And there's nothing to take that away from you. It's whatever. It, I get it. They won gold. I was wrong. It is what it is. But I'm going to pull up Spencer Dimwitty right now and play that dollar bet shit for the long term. The U.S. will not win gold in basketball within the next three Olympics. So give me some time. <laughs> It'll be a while. But they won't win gold within Wait, the next three Olympics. We, so what, one time they won't? One time. One time. Because I, I do believe this. If we have all of our car, all of our chips in and the U.S. gives a shit, you're not going to beat us, right? Like if, 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 the, if all calls go in. But what I also think is that with this country, there are a lot of times where we don't give a shit. And I am banking on that part of it along with everything else. It's, it's a matter of, look, some guys, I think there's going to be that. The same way it happened over the years, it's like, do I really want to risk anything going over there? Not really. I think these guys will probably handle it and you, you, you overlook it. I, I just think there's a possibility there, especially, like I said, the international game getting better and they're playing better. I just think the cards are kind of falling where it would. I think it's less of a shock if it happens now than it was a shock in 04, right? Like, I, I think that, that that's the point that I'm making grand scheme. I think because we won with this team, I could see us getting shocked at the next Olympics. Paris 2024 is what it sounds like. I could see us getting shot. Oh, in France against the silver medalists. I, I could see it happening. And then after that, sending another round of a dream team, basically. Right. But yeah, my initial knee-jerk reaction was, no way, we're, we're definitely not. But you're right. If we don't take it that seriously, and based on this past Olympics and just the easy American bravado, if we could send anybody, we could very easily lose. That's actually not a bad take or not a bad dollar bet either. In fact, I'm it, not going to take it. I might be on your side, KDOT. No, One final thing. What, the the team that could set anybody and win so by 20 points sounds like the women's basketball team. I think it's seven gold medals oh in a row. Gosh. The finals look like the Monsters versus the Toon Squad. I mean, they had a foot over everyone else. It was just like, this is not you even a Brittany game. And it, was, it was the just gold medal over game. People. Yeah, you're, you're totally <laughs> right. Ridiculous. Shout out to the USA women's <laughs> basketball team and Ariel Atkins and Tina Charles, two members of the Washington Mystics that came home with gold. Elsie, did you see Space Jam 2? Because I noticed you referenced Space yet. Jam 1. No, no, okay. Not yet. All right, just make it sure. <laughs> There's something that was out there. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the original monster. The original monster. That movie I, sucks too. All right. <laughs> I, I, I will say too that there's there for me there is two things. I think that's a great bet, Kadeen. I wouldn't take it either. I think that you could be onto something. Uh, but there's two more factors. One you've already touched on. If like money becomes by far the in a way the most important things in the NBA and we kind of lose the sparkle of like, we don't really care about the Olympics. It's we play in the number one league. We make all this money. I don't want to risk injury for not for little compensation. I don't really care about, you know, the accolades of international. And I do wonder, you kind of touched on it again, the Kyrie everything. We have seen players kind of mercenary themselves out where they had a parent that was from a country. And even though they are Americans, they identify as Americans, they went over and played internationally for a different team. Even one player, I believe, had a grandparent that was from Nigeria. Um, and it was Gabe uh, Vincent. Uh, he went over. And so if there were, if there was one or two stars that decided, you know, I'm not going to represent America, I'm going to go represent, you know, a, an ancestral homeland, um, you could see maybe some major fluctuations. If they were, like, if Giannis were to join Nigeria, that team was pretty good. You all of a sudden throw Giannis on there, that team could be really, really good. So I do wonder about that as well. That's, a, think, that's actually a really good point. I, go ahead, the, my, I think last, the, political, the political climate also in America right now, as a black man, I'll be honest, there's sometimes I'm not proud of this country. There are times where I'm not rah, 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 stars and stripes guy. Like, it, it, and I don't think anybody should fault me for that. And you hear a lot of these athletes do the same thing. It's like, I can't think of any bigger form of protest to say, I'm going to go back to my ancestral home when I'm going to represent this. And that being a powerful statement, maybe one time. Like, I, I just think it's a perfect storm that's brewing, that the possibility is not that far out of whack. I think that's a good point. I think that's a totally fair point. And to Spencer's point about there being mercenaries at the international level, you see it in soccer all the time too. They find the strangest relations and all of a sudden just 
represent that country. So it does happen. But KDOT, why don't we move on to one of your stronger points? Because you have been talking about Deyame Brown, rookie wide receiver for the Washington football team for quite some time now. And you are not alone. There are a couple tweets. Lake Lewis Jr., who covers the team, says he gets Terry McLaurin rookie year vibes from him. And Lake Lewis was adamant that Terry McLaurin was going to be starter after his rookie training camp and he was laughed out of the room and put some respect on Lake Lewis Jr.'s name, okay? He knows what he's talking about, clearly. And then we have Edward Ford, who is the producer for the New York Yankees pregame show, so he decided to fucking chime in as well. And he goes on to say that Diame Brown will be the best offensive rookie in the NFC East, okay? The Philadelphia Eagles in the first round took Devontae Smith, Alabama wide receiver and Heisman Trophy winner. The Giants in the same round took Cardarius Tony, wide receiver from Florida. So he thinks he's going to be better than both of them and every other rookie in the NFC East. Now, again, producer for the New York Yankees pregame show, but they both have a blue verified tick mark on Twitter, which means they're obviously correct. And anything they say is gospel and KDOT, as I said, you've gassed up Tiami Brown in the past State of the Unions. Are you buying into this hype? Very simple question. I'm all in. And the, the reason I'm all in is that, yeah, it gives me Terry McLaurin vibes. I look at the last uh, couple, last three drafts, right? Or last two drafts. And I'm looking at wide receivers. Yeah, last three drafts. Wide receivers that, above all else, not, ath- not the athleticism, not the speed, it's this. It's, it's studying, it's what it is they're doing in between here to really be able to jump out the gate and produce. And if I'm looking at De'Ami Brown on this particular roster, you've got Terry McLaurin, Curtis Samuel, Adam Humphreys. He's not going to be looked upon as anything other than a guy that's going to be able to need to run some really cool, intricate routes. And apparently he's the guy that's like figuring it out really, really quickly, which is one of the reasons that Terry hit the ground running so fast was that it wasn't that it, Terry's not just a Burnham guy. Like he does great as far as getting separation, but he's not, he doesn't have the same athletic talent that like a Calvin Johnson has or Deshaun Jackson has or Tariq Hill has. He's not that guy, but what he does is he realizes, he learns and he studies the defenses, and you can see he's plotting all of his moves right there and seeing what everybody's going to do. And apparently the Ami Brown and Terry have been like side by side through all this shit. But like you have a situation right now where these guys are learning properly. There are two positions, I think, in the NFL that are underrated as far as just what it takes mentally to really get it done, especially early on. And it's wide receiver and cornerback. A lot of times cornerbacks early on, you just got to kind of let them out on that island and they're going to get burnt rookie-wise. It, it, it's something that everybody kind of goes through. And you see the ones that really excel, the ones that are usually the more intellectual types, the ones that really study that playbook. And the same thing goes for wide receivers. If you don't have that just freakish ability from an athletic standpoint, where you're really going to get it in is just being the smartest guy on the field. And one thing I will say about that offense right now is they got some smart fucking guys on that on that roster. These are all guys that are kind of nerdy in some sense. Like Antonio Gandy Golden is a fucking nerd. He's a, he, he's a Liberty University nerd. The only reason he didn't get a lot of play last year is he was hurt most of the time. But I was excited to see what he was going to do because once again, in training camp, you heard, oh, this dude studies the playbook. Like he looks good. He's fluid in his routes. He's very determined. He's confident in what he's doing. And that combination of everything just is lights out. Not to mention the, the, the engine that makes it all go. Ryan Fitzpatrick, I saw it today. He's smelling himself, baby. He feels more confident right now than he ever has in his entire career. And I'm sorry. Everybody wants to keep going back looking five or six years ago if Ryan Fitzpatrick stats and making that be the litmus for the rest of his career. Look at the last two years. Look at the last three years. He's shown enough where you can say it's not an aberration anymore. The dude is this guy now. Fifth in the NFL and QBR last season was Ryan Fitzpatrick, and he went to Harvard. So just speaking to the, the smarts of our starting quarterback. Spence, it looked like you wanted to say something. What did you have here? I've just been watching a lot of training camp videos and I went and uh, listened to some Ron Rivera interviews that they were asking about Diame and uh, apparently everything, all the, the scuttlebutt and the buzz is, you know, I think everyone knew that he was a vertical threat because he averaged over 20 yards per catch at UNC um, and he is not necessarily a straight up burner, but he like would run deep straight routes and he himself has said that he wants to set out to prove that he's like an every down um 
all around wide receiver. And so we're seeing a lot of like little dart slant routes. We're seeing some fancy footwork, crisp cutting routes. Um, he's going over the middle, which most of these guys, especially if you're small, he's six foot. Um, they don't want to go over the middle and he's doing it. So I think that's a very impressive. And again, he's willing to put in the time. He's willing to do that work and that grinding wide rec receiver mentality. It looks pretty. Yeah. And also, I mean, here's the thing about Diame. He averaged the highest yards per reception at UNC last season. So he gets down that field. And as you had said, Spencer, and a very good point, he's willing to run through the middle. He wants to be next to Terry McLaurin. He wants to be that guy. He's got a golden opportunity because Curtis Samuel is currently on the physically unable to perform list. So he's getting a lot of reps with the ones that maybe he would not have if Curtis Samuel were healthy. So he could end up just hitting the ground running. KDOT, question for you. What would be a good season? Give me a stat line for Deami Brown that you would just sort of hope to see to call it a resounding success to match this hype a resounding success to me with the way that the receivers look on the roster and the way you need to distribute the ball i'm saying if you're looking over five touchdowns 500 yards like that's a smashing success that's in my opinion yeah. that, that that's that'd be incredible like and i think that that's not crazy sounding too much to me especially when the more you hear ryan fitzpatrick talk the more you see he's got confidence in this dude and the more you're going to see that unlike a lot of other quarterbacks that might think uh, this guy's just a rookie. I'm not going to necessarily force his ball to him. Ryan Fitzpatrick doesn't have that issue. He will do it. And if you've got somebody that you also know is studying, hitting the playbook, and he wants to be your Swiss Army knife guy, imagine he's going to get a lot of touches. Like, if he shows out that he can do it, that's all that Ryan needs to see. I mean, they get in Adam Humphreys to be that safety valve, somebody that he, uh, he, he's used to. And it, 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 trust me, during training camp, for what we understand, that's worked. But because of what these guys are showing – whether it's in the, in, the, in the classroom or on the field, it looks like he's going to be able to have confidence, not just in himself, but truly in the guys around him. Yeah, and what's crazy also, you'd mentioned Antonio Gandy-Golden. What a difference a year makes. He, he got hurt and was looking great last season. Now he may not even make the roster. I feel like it's just one of those things where it's sort of like you're at a poker table and you're playing with high blinds and high antes. You need to win a hand very, very quickly. That's what Deami Brown's doing right now. So you can feel comfortable in your position. And if you don't, you're going to have to go all in pretty quickly soon after that. And it seems like Antonio Gandy Golden, despite being a draft pick last season, may be on his way out because Adam Humphreys has come in. Curtis Samuel's there. Terry McLaurin's there. Deami Brown, who's definitely a lock for the roster. It's going to be very, very interesting. Steven Sims Jr. apparently is having an excellent camp. So they're all fighting for about five spots, maybe six. It's, it's going to be. Kelvin Harmon's name. Has Kelvin been, Harmon like is a guy that's doing really well right that now. That wide receiver so, room is insane. And it actually I'm is. still pulling for Aunt Gandy Golden just from a personal standpoint. I like dude a lot. But if he doesn't make this team, like, I get it. There's just a lot of guys. I'm excited. People didn't are sleeping you, on this offense, man. Didn't you do some camp at Liberty University? What, what, was, what did you do over there again? Was it a debate, I, debate team? Yes, I'm a graduate, um, multi-year of the Liberty University debate team. I got to meet Jerry Falwell multiple times, and I was taught by Brett O'Donnell, um, speechwriter for Bush One, and uh, he did some Reagan stuff and McCain stuff near the end. So yeah, I learned from the uh, the best. That's where Kadeen took all of his hyper-conservative values from, so. So right. conservative. Oh, I have so many stories about that damn campus. Jerry Fowell tapped me on the back and said, hey, big boy, you need any help? And I said, oh, you motherfucker, you. All right, whatever. <laughs> All right, well, that, that's going to wrap up the Washington football team talk and the Deami Brown hype. KDOT is all in, and honestly, I'm sort of buying in, too. Ryan Fitzpatrick, I think, is going to have a great year. Real quick, he is connecting really well with one Taylor Heineke, who is the future GOAT of this organization. Let's move on to the Washington Nationals, who were completely gutted. I mean gutted at the trade deadline. Now, they did it for a reason. They're investing in their future. They got a couple top prospects in Kybert Ruiz and Josiah Gray, which is great from the L.A. Dodgers, but we gave up a lot, almost everybody. Matt, why don't you go ahead and walk us through some of those trades and your thoughts on the Nationals organization as it stands right now. Yeah, uh, j just a quick run through everything we did. Josh Harrison, Jan Gomes to the A's, John Lester to the uh, Cardinals, Daniel Hudson to the to... – don't know where he went. Schwarber to the Red Sox, Brad Hand to the Blue Jays, um, which was probably the, the Schwarber, Brad Hand trades are both pretty big, but obviously the biggest deal was Max Scherzer and Trey Turner going to the Dodgers. And as you mentioned, Josiah Gray and Kyber Ruiz coming back. 
um, along with uh, Donovan Casey and uh, Gerardo Carrillo, if I'm saying yeah. it right. Um, so um, a monster, monster trade deadline across the entire league. Um, but everything that the Nats did, I, it, it seemed like they were the right moves. Um, it's clear that this team, if there was even really a core, it was kind of fluid throughout their, their good year to, to go out while they could. And, and the big piece being traded was definitely Trey Turner. To get him out, that what brought back out um, at this trade as, as the first and third prospects. And, and that, that's the trade of the line. This was the biggest probably in this century, right? With Chris Bryant, Javi Baez. We talked about Schwarber. Um, we talked about um, uh, Craig Krimble going. So um, just a, a, you know, Rizzo going. The Cubs blew up their, their core. Um, so with all that going down to land, those types of prospects, um, it seemed like it was the right time to move on. They, they did a fire sale as quickly as possible. They gave it every single moment they had. These players were going out on deadline day. So with all that included, I think it was the right move. It's, it's probably sad to see some players go, but it probably means that you can be competitive again in, in, in three years as opposed to being competitive in, in seven years. So um, that's my take. Well, I think with Josiah Gray and Kybert Ruiz, Josiah is playing right now. Right. Like he, he just struck out 10 guys the other yeah. night. Uh, Kyrie Ruiz will probably be ready next year, if not next year, then the year after. So I do like it, but yeah, just as a fan, right? Like Trey Turner, Max Scherzer, part of that world series winning team. It sucks. It sucks. Like it, it's just a really emotionally difficult time. I think we knew we were going to be sellers at the deadline, but beyond the saber metrics, beyond the numbers, just beyond the logic of the moves, it sucks being an Nats fan right now. We are not going to be doing anything this season. Spencer, what do you want to say? I also wonder what your guys' thoughts are on my, – my first thought was, what does Juan Soto think of all this? I mean, the thing that's crazy is he comes in with all of these, like, legendary – legendary pitchers for sure. Um, he's, like, the young guy. He – the expectations are high, but he's kind of – hidden behind these legends and now like he's the elder statesman he's no longer that young guy i mean he's young obviously but he's the future of the franchise and he's the now right now where everyone else is going to be looking to him for leadership everyone else is going to be looking to him to set the bar for work ethic and loyalty and professionalism and play and i just wonder man that has got to be really rough year swing and i wonder if they had him in the room saying hey are you ready to do this or if they just said that he's a professional he's getting paid all this money he needs to just do this and we're going to go ahead because he's kind of the cornerstone of your franchise and you don't want to alienate him. And I wonder if he was involved in all of this because he is now that guy. I mean, I, I go ahead, K-Dot. I think if you're Juan, you're thinking, uh, learner, guys, don't fuck this up. Pay me. Like that, That's kind of where it is right now is that they need to back up the Brinks truck for this guy. This is the guy you have to build the team around. And I think what Matt said is the weirdest thing about all of this is that if you look back at the Nats, we've been a fairly decent freaking team for the last decade. Like, it, it, like we flamed, like maybe not, maybe not a full decade, but I mean, we finished first in our division a ton of time. Like, it, we're looking at the years leading up to the World Series, right? But if you look at those teams, it's like year after year, you can't really even say it was the same team, really. Because I mean, if you look at those rosters, it was so in and out. Like, there was a lot of changes from the beginning when we started speaking to when it is you got that World Series. Like, that World Series team is, you can honestly say really, other than some of the, other than most of the pitching, two years old, tops? Like, if you're really looking at the entire squad? So, just, it feels as though there's, like, this giant fall from grace. Because, I mean, it, it's just this particular team, they won, and now it just all went to shit, like, really, really quickly. Like, I mean, it, as, a, as a Nats fan, I will say that, like, I'll take that for World Series. And the fact that we have a champion, we have a guy who I think is the second most exciting player in baseball to build around, that's, to me, and it, I, I'm cool with it. It just feels wrong. Like, it just, I look across my jerseys in my closet. I have no active players for any Washington team anymore. Kerrigan and Scherzer were my last two, and it's over, and I'm sad about it. Uh, that is always a tough, a tough day, but I would say at least like Max is a, you know, club legend. I don't know what the Jersey retirement policy is in there, but he would certainly be in that discussion here um, in DC. So that's like a legendary Jersey. I would say this. So yeah, you bring up a really good point. Like you could throw out some, some big name pieces, but like that, that 
were only here for the Nats for a couple of years and not on the championship team, like, like a Daniel Murphy, like a Jason Wirth. Um, I would argue that the window started to close when they lost their best hitter, Anthony Rendon, and never really replaced him after the World Series. Um, but this team was not built like, I would say not built like the Cubs or the Astros or the Dodgers, where there was this core that was together for like five, six years of like five, six great players. Um, you know, and, and, and they did have a good run. And again, banners fly forever. You know, that, that's going to be up there forever. Um, so it's sad, but if you're saying Juan Soto, yeah, you're, you're 22. So still incredibly young on the, most guys don't even reach the majors till they're 24. So I agree back up the Brinks truck. It's going to be a, I'm not saying Mike Trout numbers, but it's not going to be that far off. Um, that's, that's what he's going to go for. So, um, I don't know how many years he has left. It's got to be an off season priority, but the players they brought in are right around his age. So maybe you can see some growth there. And again, I don't think, Again, you got GMs don't trade their top prospects, and the Dodgers, who are the number six farm system in the nation, just trade their top two prospects. So to get that kind of return, it, it's it's kind of unprecedented in today's era, and it can make this rebuild happen. And these guys are ready to go. Like they're playing Triple A, Double A ball. You can say, yeah, Josiah Gray's already pitching the majors. Pitchers tend to need a year or two to to you know reach their level. So. You know, maybe you get those years out of the way now when you're not even that good. And then when you're starting to compete again, these guys are top of the rotation guys, all-stars, et cetera. And Juan Soto, yeah, he's probably disappointed to see his friends go, of course. But, you know, if you take a step back, it's easy to explain these moves. And it makes your, makes your contending window way closer. Or you can be like the Angels who never really admit that they sucked. And you know, you've got Mike Trout, one of the best players in history, just wasting away his entire career. I don't know what's going on today. We got Matt complimenting KDOT, and I'm going to compliment Matt and let him know that he was one of the first people, I'm talking media, anything, to identify Trey Turner as somebody that could end up being moved. I Insider. don't think a lot of people were talking about that, and Matt did look at the deal. He looked at how much time was left on, on it and realized that he's playing at an all-star level. He was an all-star, and we were going to have to pay him probably close to $300 million, right? And so if he's, that were to happen... An all-star. He's, yeah, he's a top over the last three years. He's been a top 20 player in the game. And so I just want Nationals fans to understand and It's something I need to understand, too, because emotionally I'm attached to Trey Turner. I'm going to go to root for the Dodgers just from a sentimental uh, you know, perspective. I want Max and Trey to do well. It's not like they want Trey wanted to stay, but it was always going to be Trey Turner or Juan Soto. And we were always going to choose Juan Soto. So it just happened to break out that way. The real bad deal was the Patrick Corbin one that he signed. Um, I forgot when it was, but that has really bitten us because maybe, maybe we would have had a shot to keep Trey as well as Juan. Uh, but sometimes bad deals happen in sports. And I think overall, you know, the learners, the owners have done a decent job with it and just a bad, just a bad beat. Definitely a bad beat. Um, Spencer, do you want to say anything? One little, little wrap up thing though, is, uh, an interesting team right now, and even though that they're my home team, I, I don't really follow them, but I, I think that it's very fascinating. I'm surprised what the Cubs did because they sent away a lot of offensive field players. And there are two teams right now that are proving that you really don't want to do that. Number, well, there's actually three. The Dodgers have kept most of their offensive guys. The Giants, old, old Giants that everyone wrote off their core of Crawford, Brandon Belt, um, Posey, they're having resurgent years. They brought in a very old Evan Longoria where everyone was like, oh, if this was 2009, this would be incredible. And now they bring in Chris Bryant. They were already the best team in baseball. They just got a whole lot better. And it's crazy that they're that old and they did not blow it up. They sent Madison Bumgarner. They got very lucky with a couple of pitchers that have had resurgent years, but they're fascinating. The A's, they're always in it. They deal left and right, but they've brought in offensive firepower and they're the number of four team i think um in the al i'm pretty sure maybe the three um it's it's crazy and i'm really surprised what the cubs did they sent all their offensive firepower i kind of felt like man why wouldn't you keep those guys unless it was so contractually impossible and bring in better pitching they would legitimately have a shot now they're going to be bad for a long yeah no they, yeah, they that, are that but was, that cubs fans had as emotional as for nats fans i think cubs fans were that was, probably was worse. Like, that was probably worse. Yeah, yeah, no, it definitely was. K Dot. I want to ask a question. It doesn't need to be answered now. It probably should have been something I sent before we did the pod. But I want to look, my brother and me were talking about this the other day. 
if we're looking at two cities, Los Angeles and Washington, and looking at the trades that went down between the Lakers, Dodgers, Wizards, Nationals, which city won? L.A. Which city, I think L.A. Or Washington. I mean, I think L.A. Well, certainly right now. Certainly right and now. That, my thing right is there. that if, if there's not a World Series for the Dodgers and a finals for the Lakers immediately, I, I don't I know. But I think the expectation is that there will be. And you can only – at the end of the day, we traded – Okay, so we traded Russ for depth, a lot of depth, and we got a couple nice pieces out of it. I think KCP can be nice for the team. You know, Harrell, I think, could be nice for the team. Kuzma could be too. But ultimately, the goal is to win championships, and they got a known commodity in Russell Westbrook. Now, the Dodgers got a known commodity in Max Scherzer. They got a known commodity in Trey Turner. I think that's why they win is because – at the end of the day, Kybert Ruiz and Josiah Gray, he's playing well right now. They're still prospects. You never know what happens with prospects. They're number one overall picks in years past that don't even see the majors. I mean, you just don't know when it comes to prospects. I think if you look at it from a future perspective, you love what Washington did. I think overall we did some really nice things, and we increased the probability of having a future, right? But when you look at – I always go for known commodities. I think – LA wins just because of that. But I, I go ahead, go man. Ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say one thing though with baseball is I really do feel like it is one of the most forgiving in trading known commodities. Like we were talking about that earlier. I think basketball and football is like you don't trade known commodities. There's only five guys in the court. Like that's it. With baseball, you know, the whole money ball thing is you can make it up in the aggregate. You can take players that are so, so expensive and, and, and combine two players and make it up. So I think that the Dodgers definitely won the trade but at the same time i don't think the dodgers are going to repeat they had a covid win i don't think they're going to repeat they're not the best team in baseball right now and uh i don't even know if they're going to make it to the world series to be honest i i do rate the dodgers a lot i mean if you look at their roster i think they have a case that they have like a top three player at just about every position um they, they are stacked and that's even with the whole um trevor bauer you know that guy's probably gonna get kicked out of the league um Actually, probably not. It's pro sports. So probably suspended for like five games. But um, regardless, um, it, you know, it's, it's hard to say because both LA teams were closer to championship contention before the trades happened. So if you say who's going to win next, yeah, obviously it'd be the LA teams. Um, the Dodgers, the Dodgers, the, the one thing is the Dodgers have always had a stacked farm system. And, and like, yes, they spend a lot on their teams, but they've had the number one to, they've had a top 10 farm system this whole time. So if anything, you know, the Nats had the 30th going into this trade deadline, worse than the majors. So the fact that you're getting closer to that as a, as a whole, that's really what you need because when you are contending, you need to trade away prospects. So building it up as a whole, I think it leads better to the future. I, I, I like the, tr- the rush trade for the Wizards. I don't necessarily know it makes their future great. I don't think any of those players are getting are going to, you know, be in D.C. for a long time. But get out of that contract. And, and kind of start rebuilding up. What's going on with Brad? Is Brad going to be re-signed? I know it's not a pod topic. It's not. I'm, it's I'm not. i it in there. Sh- sure, <laughs> sure. And, and then we'll move on to the Olympics, but it's not guaranteed. And that's the scary thing, right? And that's why some people wanted to trade Brad. But it seems like Tommy Shepard is talking. It seems like he's talking to Brad every single day. He's like sending him a good morning text. He's checking in on Kamaya. He's checking in on his son. He's checking in on Quinton Mayo, even like all he's checking in on everybody. He's like, How are we Brad doing? Brad is Don't we love DC? He is resigning. Bet it up. He doesn't want to leave. We are doing that to him. He doesn't want to go. I am officially no longer doing emotional hedges, so I'm not going to take that dollar bet. Otherwise, I would. You also, you've also, you've also made some takes on 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 the Wiz. You said they they wouldn't fire Scott Brooks because Russell Westbrook liked him. I said that they there was a good chance, and then we shipped right? his ass but, off. But I, 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 look, <laughs> Scott's got. Right. I, I'm, that's one of those things I'll, I'll I'll gladly be wrong about, right? But it's <laughs> but I honestly do think with the Brad thing, I think that it's the same thing that happened with Giannis when Giannis re-signed in Milwaukee. We. There wasn't a human being on the planet didn't say, what the fuck are you doing? And I think Brad is in a situation right now where we're kind of expecting that he wants out, but he could have chose to leave over the last three years and he has not said a word. I just actually think he's a lot more comfortable we're giving him credit for being. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I do think that's true. Uh, we we got to move on though. We got to move okay. on to the Olympics. Otherwise we could talk about Brad forever. Um, and it's officially over. It's officially over the United Who's States. Brad? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Couldn't resist. <laughs> I got to send a link to that specific video. Um, the United States 
basically won the Olympics. They had the highest medal count. They got the most gold medals edging China by one. It was really, really close, but we managed to do it. You can shout out probably Caleb Dressel for just being so dominant over there in Tokyo. But the question is, Elsie, we're going to start with you. I haven't heard from you in a bit. Is what was the most impressive gold medal win to you? I was trying to find the unmute button after all these years. Um, yeah, so absolutely, I think, first of all, they won the Olympics is the most American thing to say. Um, but yes, I guess they did. Um, also, because they won by one medal, I would say everyone's gold medal actually really, really mattered this time. Uh, but however, however, I do have, I have one American gold medal that I really, I, I think I really enjoyed and I, and I think it's my favorite one. And then I have one that's uh, from a Dutch uh, Olympian who I think had a, an amazing story. But I think the American one is Suni Lee. And in the uh, all around you know, gymnastics, I think that the fact that, you know, obviously every single ad for the past year well, had Simone Biles in it, right? Like she's the GOAT. She's going to win every single medal, uh, every single gold medal in every event. Um, and then you go to the games thinking, you know, I'm just behind Simone, right? Like I, I have no pressure on me, right? Like I'm just going to do my best. We all know that she's, all the eyes are going to be on her. And then she steps away, obviously, for, for reasons we've already talked about. And all of a sudden, all the eyes are on you. Now, winning an, a gold for America is on you. And she does it. Um, and, and she won in, you know, in the all-around event, which I think is it's probably the hardest to do, right? Because you have to be so well-rounded and you have to do all five events um, against other, other gymnasts who are like, holy shit, Simone Baz not here. This is my chance. Um, and so I think that was, I, I just love the idea that she took on all this pressure out of nowhere, right? Because she didn't expect to, to have to be the one and then won it. Um, so that's, that's my American one. I think for me, though, the, the greatest gold medal story of, of this Olympia, uh, of this Olympics, where I gotta read her, read her name because she's Dutch, uh, is Annemiek van Vluten, who I saw in Rio 2016 crash her bike and land face first like seven miles away from the, uh, from the gold medal, she was first. This is an 83-mile run, so a uh, uh, race, sorry. So she crashed in Rio, broke three vertebrae, and just broke her back, said, I'm going to be back. Five years later, wins gold for her country. Silver is also for the Dutch. And I just think, what a comeback story. Completely, you know, uh, at an injury that most people would be like, I'll be glad if I walk again. She said, I'm going to be back on my bike and wins gold five years later. I think that's just absolutely amazing. Holy cow. What was her name again? So her first name is Annemiek, which is A-N-N-E-M-I-E-K. And mm -hmm. it's Van Vluten. Annemiek Van Vluten. Damn, that events. is impressive. That amazing. is absolutely impressive. Amazing. Um, I remembered hearing about that too, but I just didn't know. I didn't know her name. I didn't know she was Dutch. That's that's fucking awesome. Um, yeah. Spencer, what about you? Have you a gold medal? I've got uh, just one honorable mention moment. Did you all see the Isaiah Jewett and Nigel Amos, the Team Botswana, Team USA guy, the uh, American guy Jewett tripped up Botswana guy Amos in the 800 meter and they got up, hugged, and then they cool runnings did together where they like cross the finish line holding like holding each other. Very cool moment. No medals, losers, but really cool moment. Um, I have a couple. So number one for overall team, I have to say Australia was like incredibly impressive to me. They finished with 46 total medals. They were the sixth total medal count. And that population is 25 million people. And if you look at every other country above them, it's almost uh, at least double their population. So like very, very impressive impressive from a population standpoint. And then I have just a couple. Um, I was going to go with SUNY. I think just the poise, the courage, all that stuff. It was, everyone's been singing her praises. Really, really impressive. Um, but my, my, my two individuals for male, female, uh, Chris Amore, um, she was, she's the best surfer in the world. H incredibly high expectations. She came in, she crushed it. Um, and she won the first Olympic surfing medal. Uh, just very, very impressive overall. And she's just a great ambassador for that sport. And then, according to Matt, the greatest show, the 100-meter dash, Lamont Marcel Jacobs, out of nowhere, Italian guy. Uh, such a shock, really cool. Seems like a great guy. I was, I was shocked, and good for that guy. 
Yeah. All right. That looked cool. Um, that was yeah. so shocking. That was so shocking. I got a Washington Post notification that was like, Italian dude wins the 100 meter dash. I'm like, I don't think they would have said that if some other guy won it. Like, it's just so shocking they put it as, a, as an alert. That, I mean, that's a shock to all of us that an Italian guy won the 100 meter dash. I don't think anyone's expecting that. I feel like it's, no. it's, run, uh, it's not run well by the Italians, but apparently it is. <laughs> apparently it is. K Dot, what about you? All right, so I'm going to go honorable mention just because it's half my blood is the Jamaican uh, women's relay. Lights out. You want to talk about small island nation in the Caribbean nobody, that wields more influence than maybe any other country ever? Inventors of hip hop, fastest people in the world. You can't touch that little island country. It's just so legit. Proud of my Jamaican blood. But since I didn't watch a lot of the Olympics this year, in all honesty, I went more scientific with my answer. So I don't have an individual performance. I have two team performances. And the reason I went with it is I think it's just the hardest single sport in the Olympics. Water polo. So I'm going to give it Croatia and the U.S., men's, women's. I've looked at a lot of different uh, articles. I, I started doing a reading about what the hardest sport to just compete in with the Olympics. And it looks like water polo has it by a, by a mile, which – it was kind of crazy to me, but when you think about it, gymnastics is really, really tough. I mean, the, the stakes are really, really high if you fuck up even once. So once again, Simone Biles, if you weren't feeling it mentally, totally understand. So fuck away from that beam, right? But it, there's a quote that I, that I saw about water polo. I'm going to read it real quick. On top of treading water for 30 minutes and swinging up to a mile per game, athletes sneak in blows to each other similar to ice hockey while trying to not touch the ground, not drown, and score points out all at the same time. Water polo is just tough. So I'm sorry, regardless of whatever happens in the Olympics, the toughest and coolest and hardest gold medal is some water polo. So I would die, it sounds like, if Easily. we were to play water polo. Or touch polo. the ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd certainly die. Wow, I did not realize uh, the athletes there were that freaking tough. Okay. It's really, it's really physical. Like if you watch it and they sometimes show cameras under, like they're, it looks like they're trying to drown the opponent. It's, it's pretty <laughs> shitty. <laughs> yeah. I, it, right now, right now, with my current body state, no chance I'm escaping. I'm just drowning. Easy. Oh my God. Okay. Well, shout out water polo. Matt, floor is yours. Most impressive gold medal. Most impressive gold medal. I think it was the athlete we talked maybe second most going into the Olympics. It's Katie Ledecky in that 1500 meter swim. Um, the camera person couldn't even follow the race because you either were following Katie Ledecky who was at one end of the pool or you're following the rest of the pack who was there. So um, I think she owns the top 18 fastest yeah. her recorded times. Um, so pure dominance. If we want to talk about, you know, greatest athletes of their sport, she's in that conversation um hundred percent so you know yeah we talked about she got a silver medal and short stuff she's like all right hey let's get back to my bread and butter crushed it great performance love just utter dominance on the world's biggest global stage so to totally love that uh, most impressive um you definitely had this one for a while um but i'm gonna go with i'm gonna go with this what would you guys guess is the population of bermuda one million Ooh. We think go half a million. million, two million. I, was, I, I think it like eight, nine hundred thousand. All right, so it's sixty-two thousand. Okay. Oh my god! Oh my god! Which is this is a geography which is, podcast, <laughs> which is like half the size of my like Detroit suburb town that I grew up in. Um, and they sent only sent two athletes, but they got a gold medal. And I was in triathlon, women's triathlon. Um, so that was. Um, Flora Duffy, and and the thing is, it's like not even that obscure of a sport. It was just a women's triathlon, which is pretty. I popular. watched that actually. So, yeah. so for that yeah. country of that size to only send two athletes and get one, imagine if like half the U.S. It's a great ratio. <laughs> yeah. So um, they were the smallest country to ever win a gold medal at the Summer Olympics. So hats off to them and uh, nice. congrats. Damn. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, LC Spencer, I think we were at Cleveland Park Bar and Grill when Flora Duffy we won. Yeah, live. Yeah. Uh, Talk about a hard sport too. Jesus. She Why won by a lot too. Yeah, no, I don't know how people <laughs> get into, I don't know when you wake up and go, you know what, I could do a triathlon. And then all of a sudden you're winning a gold medal in it. Uh, good shouts. Good shouts, Matt. Uh, for me, um, individual, best individual, Ahmed Hafnawi. 
Tunisian swimmer, 18 years old, in lane eight in the 400-meter freestyle swim, and no one talked about him. Absolutely no one talked about this guy. Through the whole race, they were 350 meters in before anyone mentioned he was in the lead. Like, they were talking about the people in lanes four and five. And I just think it's cool that a swimmer from Tunisia ends up winning gold, and he's just 18. I mean, I think it's really, really cool. Um, in terms of most impressive nations, how about the hosts? How about Japan? They finished third in gold medals. They did not have a home crowd to cheer them on. They ended up with 58 medals total. I thought they did great. My expectations for Japan were maybe fifth or sixth in terms of gold medals, maybe even lower. Third? That's awesome. And then Cuba. Because I don't think of gold medals in Cuba. They got seven. They're and they the, finished, yeah. finished with 15 they're total. The, What's up? They're the absolute best historically in Latin America. Like they have... So, okay, I'll let you finish because I had a, a bigger point that I think you was going to fit in it, but, but go ahead. Well, oh, so six out of their seven gold medals, wrestling and boxing. So apparently they are just incredibly dominant in those sports and they got one more in canoeing, which I thought was kind of odd, but cool. Um, but yeah, shout out Cuba. How about it? I, I did not expect them to have as many gold medals as they did or as many medals as they did. I thought that was kind of neat. Go so ahead, like, see. What was the point? I think because so Matt mentioned the population of Bermuda and uh, Spencer mentioned the population of Australia. Like, obviously, population matters, but it's clearly the way to win medals or to have athletes that can compete at this level is an interaction between population and infrastructure, right? Like the like the U.S. wins all these medals because their women are fucking amazing because there's so much infrastructure for women to play sport or women to play sports. Go to Argentina, try to play a sport as a woman. Like, good fucking luck. There's right. no I would support say relative to other countries. Support relative to other countries, of course, right? Yes. And, which which in the Olympics comes comes through, right? And so with Cuba, it's a similar thing where like there's actually you know without getting into the policies of Cuba, they do actually have like a state sponsored support system for athletes to compete at this level. And so if you look at the historical uh, you know tables of of uh, medals. Um, I don't know if I cut off a little bit there, but if you look at the historical uh, tables of medals for all Latin America, Cuba is absolutely dominant, followed by Brazil, which is a little bit of that population game. Um, and then everyone else is like, you know, whenever they can win a gold, it's like goes on front cover of all the newspapers and whatnot. So it's like, the yes, the population matters, but so much of this is just a matter of infrastructure supporting kids and supporting teenagers and supporting professional professional athletes once they get there um if you try to be a professional in a lot of sports in a lot of countries i would say in most countries you would need a second job right like you can't just do that so it's it's just a matter of of that infrastructure to me that i think is is so uh so impactful and you can see that in, in the olympics so clearly and i think japan did you know something similar here where they've been preparing for this right like they they uh, they were talking about uh, how the, the teams were were prepared for these Olympics at home. Obviously, they wanted to do in front of a crowd, but it's, yeah, it's it's decades of preparation. Yeah. And again, I do think it would have been neat to see the home crowd there just to see if they could have willed one or two of their athletes onto another gold medal. Again, 27 is a lot. 27 is a absolutely. lot. It could have gotten a 30 insane. or something like that, depending on the adrenaline pumping over there. And that's, anyway, going to conclude the Olympic section, most impressive gold medal victory. And now we get to the... Wait, I have Union. one other thing. Go ahead. One last thing. Yeah. I have to throw out one fun trivia question that I just came up with right now. Then you got to. Can anybody, anybody give me the name of the country uh, that won the most medals without winning a gold? What was the country and what was the medal count? Matt... Don't look up. I see you. Can you cheating? Can you give us a continent, maybe like a uh, give us a give us a clue? Uh, it is in. Oof, man. <laughs> Don't I guess look it's it in, up. It's in. I think it's in Europe. <laughs> okay, it could so be Asia. Okay. Oh, Eurasia, okay. Maybe? So some Eastern. Okay. It could be country. Turkey. Yeah. Could be Turkey. I was initially going to say Ukraine because I remember looking up the medal count, but I think they have a gold. But they had like twelve bronze and like six silvers and maybe one gold. Um. I guess I'd go Turkey, but I feel like they've surely got a gold. If anybody doesn't have any guess, I'll just throw it out there. Uh, our favorite Borat is from this country, Kazakhstan. They won eight bronze, nothing else, eight bronze. Awesome. And they have the highest medal count of any non-gold medal winning country. And their president, their prime minister put them on blast for their performance. But big shout out to Kazakhstan, eight bronzes. 
Kazakhstan, we are with you. Maybe next time we'll cover you in the State of the Union, but it's a DC Sports Wraparound coverage segment. And we are going to begin with the Washington football team. I know we talked about them a little bit, but KDOT, what is the update? Do we have a game this week? Is that happening? We do. Football's back, motherfuckers. Football's back. No. All my Sundays got football until February again. I love it, man. Uh, we got New England coming up on Thursday. Should be interesting. First time Ron Rivera seen Cam Newton since he coached him. Um, could, could be kind of fun. Uh, I think more than anything, we're just excited to see. Uh, I know what I'm more excited to see than anything else, which is uh, Mr. Taylor Heineke putting on a show. I'm putting yes, that sir. right now. You're looking across the NFL. Preseason MVP Taylor Heineke. You can wrap it up. It's a done deal. I'm looking at, at a minimum 400 yards, six touchdowns coming up on Thursday. Easy. Just saying. It's, it's, it's lights out. Um, I am kind of disappointed. We did sign a Cole Boozer, uh, a, a lineman who would have protected Taylor Heineken. I mean, Heineke, which would have been amazing. But he lasted, I think, 18 hours before he got cut. Yeah. So won't be able to see that. Um, but, no, just excited to see it back. And we just want to see, especially what these wide receivers are doing. And if the, uh, these, the, that defensive line could uh, get after Cam, get him on the ground a couple times. Yeah, shout out Cole Boozer. It is unfortunate. 18 hours, a lot more than I would have lasted or anyone over here. Um, but maybe he'll land on another NFL team. That game can be seen on the NFL Network. I'm sure it can also be seen on NBC Sports Washington, 7.30 p.m. on Thursday. Let's look out for Diame Brown, who does have a strong connection with one Taylor Heineke, who will be the preseason MVP. And now let's move on to the Washington Nationals, where Matt is going to update us. And then I have a game for you guys. Okay. Well, speaking of games, the Nationals played some games. Exactly. Well done. Well done. Anyway, <laughs> wow. Here we go. So, as we mentioned, Literary since math. those trades, it has been a tough go for the Nationals. They get sweeped by the Phillies, and DC's favorite ex athlete, Price Harper, goes off for the next extra base hit in every game, two home runs, and four ribeye stakes. That being said, he was blowing kisses to the crowd, showing him off, and that's a lot of work to still have zero rings. Proceeded to lose. Two of three to the Braves. Uh, so that is losing six of seven games. They are now in the series opener with the Mets, where they will play three and then take on the Braves, who have had their own issues and are going to be able to hot trick themselves. So tough sledding for the Nats and probably will be for the next season and a half. But uh, we'll talk to you guys in 2023. Oh, I thanks like, for the I like the mental but... calculation there. <laughs> <laughs> he, t- he took an extra second, you forecast. First off, if I could qu- <laughs> just quickly react, I love the voice when you're delivering the scores. I love the forecast, as if you're just, you know, in front of a green screen, and you're like, and you can see some rain over here. Just nothing but losses for a season and a half. We'll check in 2023. A big fan of that. Well done. Well done, Matt. Really enjoyed that. And because of all the trades, because of all the trades, I figured I went to one of the games where Bryce Harper uh, hit a bomb. We lost five to four against the Philadelphia Phillies. I couldn't help but notice I didn't really know any of the names on the roster except for a few. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read you a name and you are going to tell me, is that person a Washington national? Yes or no. The rule here is Matt, you will always go last because I feel you know the roster best probably. Uh, so we are going to go in order. LC, Spencer, K. Matt for each of the names. Okay. This is going to be bad. This is this is going to be bad. But let me tell we're, you, we're I think our title of of a Washington DC. Yeah, I'm a, You're an asshole for this. You just you're losing. You're you're degrading our credibility. Our subscriber 100%. count is just plummeting <laughs> right now. But I but also want to get an idea that we. It, at least well, know a little bit about baseball. Now we're like, I, I, have faith. Faith. Hey, hey. I have faith in you guys. Elsie's ready. ready. Elsie's ready. He doesn't even watch the sport. We gotta, everyone has to have their hands I'm up, though, flipping. so there's no I'm cheating. Flipping. Correct. You do need to have your hands up. Everyone show your hands right now. I'm flipping. Hands the up. worst is going to be if Matt gets these things wrong. It's going to be amazing. I'm can, I put, okay. can I put hey, my hey, hands hey. up to the side? I'm wearing Black Lives Matter things, and I don't like this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. There are, there are 10 total. Two are the easiest ever. Okay. Elsie, we begin with you. The name. Is this person a Washington National? Trey Turner. We just, we've been talking no. about this. No. It, it's Spencer. Tails. Spencer, we go around. <laughs> no. K-Dot? In my heart, he's forever a National. No. <laughs> Regan. No. 
No. All right. One for one. Great start. The second Coins name. Ready. Elsie, we begin with you. Juan Soto. Heads. Yes. <laughs> I knew that one. That's a yes. Big, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. 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 Matt. The yeah. second right. most popular. Two for two. Hey, guys. We know what we're doing. We are a baseball podcast. Here we go. Javier Gomez, LC. Dale Snell. Spencer. Yes. K Dot. Yeah, right? I'll tell you at the end, Matt. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. LC is the only one correct. <laughs> <laughs> Spencer, I leaned on you, buddy. <laughs> you I don't know here. anything. <laughs> <laughs> I love this game. Javier Gomez is a Spanish Olympian. He hold on, hold on. <laughs> he, that means y'all are worse than random. That's what that means. No, no, no. no. Hey, racist? listen, listen. No, no. That's why I came up with the name. We have a lot of anyway. All right. So that's Javier Gomez, Spanish Olympian. I've been to three games too. God. All right. Next name, LC Josiah Henson. Already flipped it. That's the heads. Yes, sir. Okay. Is it not? Spencer? No. No? K dot? Yes. Regan? No. Okay. The nose have it. He is not a Washington national. He was an author, abolitionist, and minister born in 1789 in Maryland. That was Josiah Henson. He is not a Washington national. He'll be 232 years old. Right that is now, a believe. good, like, it's either a great sports name or, yeah, like a minister from the 1700s. Those were the only two options for the name Josiah Henson. All right, next up, Luis Garcia. Elsie. Uh, there's like a billion of those in the world. So that could be a yes or a no. <laughs> That's all As correct. all of these could I'm going to go with yes. <laughs> okay, he's going no. yes. Spencer goes no. K dot. We're going no. I'm actually so proud of this game. Matt, uh, no. Former baseball player named Luis Garcia, Tiger and Diamondback. Maybe still a current one. No. Uh, there is a version of Luis Garcia on the team. He is a second <laughs> baseman <laughs> for the team. And in fact, if he batted really well <laughs> yesterday. No, oh, he played and batted well. Great, great, great. Yeah. If you had said no, I would have dollar bet that there's somebody in the in the staff at least named Luis Garcia. Named Luis Garcia. Just, Luis just Garcia by is a nut. Sure. All right. He is a nut. <laughs> Five names left. Julio Chavez. Elsie. No. 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 K dot. No. No. Matt. I don't think so, but the way you're like skimming through these no's, like, no, no. No, I think it is. No, we got it. I'm going to say no. That's that's a party. That's a party. You were all correct. He is not. He's a Mexican boxer. Next name, Phil Henley. Yes. No. No, I don't like the name. He's not a baseball player sounding name. I'm going to say yes. You're going to say yes. So this was a name I made up, purely fictitious. He is not a Washington national. When I looked him up, it's a guy on Instagram with 103 followers. Give him a follow at Phil Henley <laughs> on Instagram. Probably wonder why his account's blowing up, but it's going to after this yeah, video. Blow, so that's blowing up. Blowing up. <laughs> blowing up. Up next, Tres Barrera. Going back Tres to my roots. Barrera. Heads. Yes. 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 Okay, not. Yeah. Just don't with the crap. Okay. Matt? No. It's a party for three of you. Yes, oh. he is the catcher for the Washington Nationals. Elsie, that coin is unbelievable. Up next, there are two names left. Ryan Carter. Oh, fucked yes. it up. Heads, yes. It's way too generic of a white guy named now. Yeah, I'm going now. That's my initial thought. And Matt, you said yes or no? I said yes. Oh, and he jumped the gun too. No, he is not. God. Spencer is correct. That was the most generic white name I could come up with. Therefore, he is not. He is a 34-year-old pro basketball player. I don't know where he's playing right now. Last name, Riley Adams. Is he a Washington national? Yes or no? Elsie, beginning with you, you're the leader, I think. Tails now. That's another one that's really generic. That's, that's a no. <laughs> okay. I'm going yes on that one. I'm going yes. Okay, Matt and K. Dot finish on a high. Riley Adams is, in fact, a Washington National. He is a catcher. Thank you all so much for playing. I, I don't figured... know who won, but Spencer lost. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> No, I think I got, I might've got the most wrong. But a lot of Nats fans don't even know. I mean, we were at the game and they had no idea who the heck was coming up to bat. So honestly, to me, no shame. 
If you had played the same game with me, I would have had no idea. That was just incredibly difficult. I think you guys did admirably over there. Elsie, did the players you know? Did the players know that they play for the Nets? <laughs> some of them do some of them that don't. would be great okay good <laughs> we yeah, should ask Juan Soto if he knows all these things <laughs> well so Josiah Gray for his first start actually walked out in his Dodgers uniform and they asked him to come back and said no put the, put on the net that's not not what happened thank oh, you shit. Lord. <laughs> oh man <laughs> this game fuck you up all right cool we're gonna move on to the Washington Spirit women's soccer we lost to the portland thorns at home at segra field one nothing we are now zero and three at segra field and it just feels like a big fuck you to all spirits fans it is in loudon county it is in leesburg you have to drive there there's no metro you have to drive there to go and all you do is see the team lose and then one person in your party presumably sober because they have to drive back is responsible that is just way too much to put on fans they should just play all their games at audi field where they are 1-0 and 1 they have won one and they've tied one so hopefully they just play more over there the big news big news and it happened today at the time of this recording the head coach richie burke has stepped down as head coach citing health concerns so he's actually going to step away for a little bit but when he comes back he's going to come back in a front office role so the Washington Post came out with an article where they are highly skeptical that there are even health concerns. It was a very surprising read from the Washington Post for them to put health concerns in quotes, for them to say, hey, Richie's not been doing well from a performance standpoint. The team honestly has been fine. They're in seventh place, but the standings are so tight. They could be in second after this next game. So we'll see what happens. But up next, a game not at Segra Field, Friday at the Houston Dash at 8.30 p.m. on Twitch. So we can maybe win this game. And funnily enough, we played the Dash in Houston and won earlier this season, but the game was supposed to be at Segra Field. Instead, we won a home game in Houston. We had to move over there. The renovations were not fully done, so travel to Houston, apparently for the best. Anyway, that's Segra Field. Let's talk about Audi Field, and let's talk about D.C. United. How about two straight wins? A 4-2 road win over FC Cincinnati, and then a 2-1 win over CF Montreal. D.C. United is looking good, boys. Coach Hernan Lozada. Matt, if Mikel Arteta doesn't work out, I kind of like this guy. Not going to lie, and we're pretty cheap when it comes to stuff like this. So we'll see, but this Argentine genius has got it figured out. He's got everyone playing really, really well. I'm sure Elsie knows all about Argentine genius as he has won himself up next in the buzzsaw Nashville on Sunday at 7 p.m. The game can be seen on NBC Sports Washington and streamed on DCUnited.com. And finally, Spencer, we have a big game tonight at the time of this recording. The Sacramento Kings are taking Sacramento. on the Washington Wizards. Davion Mitchell looks fantastic. Did you see that? Did you see him lock down Buck Knight? Yeah, oh. Well, now you know why I was so high on Davion Mitchell. I wanted that in D.C. so, so badly. He looks spectacular. We're going to get our first look at first-round pick Corey Kispert, but we are going to be missing some people due to COVID. So Isaiah Todd, who is a round two pick one, is not going to be playing, and a couple others are not going to be playing as well. So we'll see what happens there. But this is District Divided. Thank you so much for listening. I am Amit. That is Matt. That is LC, KDOT, and Spencer. Good to see you all again. We were refreshed after that week off last week, and we will see you next Wednesday at 3 p.m., which is where we release every single episode. We will talk to you guys later. Thanks for listening.